Welcome. Thank you for joining us for Story Hour in the Library. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our student readers today um, and joining us for this special occasion. It's by far one of my favorite readings that we do every year. It's an opportunity for us to hear from our own Cal students, faculty, and staff. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask you to silence your cell phones, and if you have to get up um, during the reading, if you can do so quietly. If you'd like to find out more about Story Hour in the Library, we have a Facebook page, as well as you can sign up at the front um, for emails, and we email you about once a month about our upcoming readings. Um, also, feel free to check our website, storyhour.berkeley.edu, to find out about the upcoming readings uh, for next year. Now, I'd like to invite Vikram up to do our first introduction. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, Evan Bauer is in his second year at Berkeley studying English, creative writing, and Japanese. He's originally from Santa Cruz, California, and writes both short fiction and poetry. He's also the editor of the Berkeley Fiction Review. Um, thank you to everyone for coming out. This is a really exciting opportunity. Um, so I recently read a book called 100 Apocalypses and Other Apocalypses by an author named Lucy Corin. And it's essentially a collection of flash fiction where each story centers on an apocalypse of sorts. And so a lot of them feature a very literal reference to an apocalypse, but many of them are just kind of these small, quiet moments of devastation. And I just really love that kind of terminology for that. Um, so I've been trying to write some apocalypses of my own. This is called His Father's Hands. They hung at the bottom of burly arms too long for his body, which was like an egg on two toothpicks. When the boy came home for winter break, they gripped his back in an embrace. Welcome home, son. The new piano was finally done after three years of his father working on it, so the boy asked to see it. Somewhere along the line, after growing up in a house overflowing with pianos, the boy had at last decided that he wanted to learn to play, just as the only one left was a perpetual work in progress in the garage. The father joked that the boy had 12 hours to learn before the piano shipped out tomorrow if he stayed up all night. What timing after all these years, he said. If ever a piano deserved to be called grand, it was this one. A piano the size of an aircraft carrier, or maybe one of the square states in the Rocky Mountains. His father sat down and lifted the key cover the way you might expect someone who has spent a lifetime tuning and restoring pianos to lift a key cover. The boy stood behind him and ran his fingers through the father's hair, which still covered his whole head, but was maybe a tiny bit sparser than before. It reminded the boy of moonlight on the Tuolumne River. OK, Dad, you can teach me how to play now, the boy said. And his father said, OK, watch and learn. And then he began to play a song from his tiny repertoire, a repertoire so small it could fit into the palm of an infant, maybe three or four songs total that he really knew how to play. A repertoire much smaller than you'd expect from a person who spent a lifetime tuning and restoring pianos. Maybe it was because his fingers were large and sandpapery from a lifetime of climbing rocks and plucking strings and lifting toddlers and fixing everything that dads know for some reason how to fix. And now only these three or four songs could accommodate the width of his fingers. But he was playing one of them now, and the boy discovered he couldn't recall the name of it, even though it had echoed throughout his childhood maybe a million times. Whenever they had driven anywhere, the father would put on classical music and quiz him on each song's composer. The boy would always yell, Scarlatti, before the question was over, because he thought the name funny and didn't have a mind for memorizing classical music compositions at that age. Occasionally, it actually was Scarlatti, but most of the time it was, nope, Beethoven, or nope, Chopin. And now the boy stood still, hoping some flourish of keys would trigger a remembrance of the song's name or composer. After all, there were only three or four to remember, so why couldn't he? By now, the boy's younger siblings had gathered in the garage and stood motionless as well. The boy stood transfixed by his father's silver hair and thick fingers and suddenly found it difficult to breathe. Already, there was so little time left to listen. Thank you. And our next reader is Rachel King. Rachel is a double major in pure mathematics and English with a minor in creative writing, and she is currently a third year student here at Berkeley. Hi. 
Hi, um, I wrote a short story last semester for my creative writing class, and I decided that I was going to read the uh, very beginning of it today. So, do you remember the day our landlady told us our apartment might be haunted? We'd been searching for a new apartment for months. The usual apartment hunting tactics had been employed. Long hours of scrolling through internet listings, admiring photos and cringing at prices. The first month had felt like an adventure. Early Saturday morning, we'd walk down the pier, passing by deserted children's playgrounds and empty tourist spots as the gray sky drizzled into the ocean. We'd arrive at our favorite cafe just as they opened their doors, the scent of freshly baked sourdough bread merging with their morning batch of chocolate chip cookies. Shaking off our rain-covered hoods, we'd order mugs of steaming lattes and lay claim to the popular overstuffed couch, settling back next to the fire and propping up our laptop between us. After a few weeks of searching, reality began to seep in. The luxurious two-bedroom apartments were comprised of a room the size of a closet and an old living room. Cozy dining nook meant there was no dining room, so the owners had squeezed a hardwood bench and small countertop into a corner of the kitchen. View of the bay meant you might be able to see a sliver of water if you peered out of the window at just the right angle, and working appliances meant old gas stoves and showers that ran out of hot water in about 10 minutes. Our prospects began to seem dimmer than the city. So we'd adapted. Whenever a decent listing appeared, we'd show up hours early to the open viewing, attempting to beat out the other frantic couples ready to sign the lease on the spot. We'd begun to purposefully misspell our keywords, hoping to uncover hidden listings that others might miss due to typos. We'd prayed that the owners of nice places would forget to include pictures in their advertisements, and we'd always show up to the viewings, portraying the image of a glowing, perfect, super financially responsible couple. When months had passed by and we still hadn't beaten out other prospective renters, we'd begun to fray around the edges. Our exciting adventure had turned into life in the city hell. Do you remember the day we'd been walking through Golden Gate Park and I'd stopped to verbalize the pros and cons of being homeless? At least the park had a yard, I'd said. That's when you knew I'd stopped thinking rationally. When we'd stumbled onto this listing, it felt like our last hope. The apartment was in a small building on the outskirts of the city. In a final surge of energy, we'd arrived four hours early to the showing, determined to beat everyone there. We'd failed. A couple sat on the porch stairs, waiting, their bodies carefully blocking the front door. They'd smiled at us as we'd walked up, and I'd experienced an alarming urge to become violent. I'd left to take a walk while you waited. The fog was slowly dying inside the city, the white drops fading away to reveal tight clumps of buildings, sprawling trees and worn down streets. Gusts of wind brought brown, crinkled leaves up into the gutters, pressing them against the deserted plastic bags and damp newspapers. The lamplights were still glowing, and their lights formed halos in the fog. As I'd walked along the streets, I'd watched them grow dimmer and dimmer until they died. I'd bought a coffee from a little cafe on the corner and sipped up small pieces of hope with the burning liquid. Maybe, I thought, this would still work out. Maybe we'd finally have a home. By the time the landlady had arrived at the apartment, the line of hopeful renters had grown so long I couldn't make out its end. Do you remember the feeling we'd had when we walked inside? Wooden floors, a fireplace, spacious rooms and closets, most importantly, rent controlled. The apartment was everything we'd been looking for and more. But we'd arrived second, so the other couple had received the offer. They'd rejected it. When the landlady called us, we were shocked. How could anyone turn that apartment down? That's when we found out that it might be haunted. The landlady had met us for coffee. Stirring in her cream and sugar in rhythmic circles, she'd informed us that the latest tenant, an elderly lady with a fondness for pink foam curlers and long dressing gowns, had died. That's why the apartment was available. Apparently, the old woman and her husband had lived in the place for 20 years before he'd passed. After his death, the landlady had begun to visit monthly, chatting with the old woman over tea and collecting her rent check. She'd felt sorry for her, she'd said. She'd seemed lonely. Then one day, the landlady had arrived to discover the old woman was dead, her body lying cold and shriveled on the bedroom floor. The landlady couldn't promise us that this woman's soul had moved on. She told us that she understood if we didn't want to sign the lease. We'd signed. Neither of us had believed in ghosts. Our apartment hell was finally over. 
We'd moved in our furniture and painted the walls and posted our photos all over social media. For a week, we'd been high on our good luck. Then, everything changed. Thank you. All right, our next reader is Pei Ting Ling. So, Pei Ting Si Ling attended public school from kindergarten through high school in the South Bay before leaving California to pursue an undergraduate degree from Georgetown in international relations and a master's in East Asian studies from Columbia. She is a six-year PhD student in the history department, studying modern Chinese history and history of medicine. Her dissertation is on knowledge production surrounding Western pharmaceutical and Chinese herbal medicine treatments for tuberculosis in early mid 20th century Shanghai. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming on this Thursday. Um, so this essay was written for a contest and the prompt this year was on a public university. I wrote it while I was doing, well actually I heard about it while I was uh, doing my re dissertation research in Shanghai and then came back and thought about it for quite a bit. So um, it's called This Most Unlikely of Dreams and it's based on my six years as a graduate student and graduate student instructor here at Berkeley in the history department. Berkeley is a place of daily contradictions, a public university in an increasingly privatized world. Here, the market imperatives of efficiency and rationalization collide with an irrational dream of equal access to an education, regardless of economic resources. Lecture halls are filled with hundreds of heads, some nodding off. We graduate student instructors are loaded with discussion sections stretched to 20 students. My classmates and students are of all kinds a single mother, a firefighter, and a former theater accountant in his 40s. Some can barely put together a coherent paragraph, others stunned with the lyric beauty of an opening sentence. The hallways of Dunel are populated by students squatting and sitting on the floor waiting for office hours to start. Some come with paper drafts, eager to refine their arguments. Others appear only after a cajoling email sheepish about a stack of assignments not yet submitted. The more efficient course of action would be to spend as little time on teaching and grading as possible, not to return their papers with comments on grammar and structure, and instead to focus on being productive, churn out chapters and articles in order to have a slim chance at that tenure track job and avoid the precarious adjunct fate that has befallen so many of my peers. But it is hard to turn a cold ear to the students as they talk about the jobs they are working to pay their tuition, the domestic violence they endured at home, and the anxieties about finding a job after they graduate. Even if one survives long enough to become a professor, it seems like they are subject to pressures of a different scale. Their office and salaries are modest, but teaching loads are heavy. It is hard to feel like one can make a request of someone already so burdened. One gets the sense that they too are working to do so much with much less. Sometimes I chance upon members of the wider community. I see their thick glasses and gray hair in classes and at lectures. Once, at the monthly poetry reading in the Morrison Library, an elderly woman saw me standing at the back of the room and motioned to an empty seat next to her. A professor in the music department read Robert Haas's poem, Meditation at Lagunitas. All the new thinking is about loss. In this, it resembles all the old thinking. The idea, for example, that each particular erases the luminous clarity of a general idea. And for just a few moments, we all sit together quietly in that big open room with tall ceilings. That was a wonderful reading. I hope to see you next time, she said. Let us keep this place, our public university, this most unlikely of dreams. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Emma Rosenbaum. She's graduating this May with a degree in English and facilitates a weekly short fiction workshop for the English department. 
She has had several short pieces, fiction pieces, and personal essays published in the Weekender Arts and Culture magazine, and recently won the Eisner Prize for Prose. After graduation, Emma will be moving to Tanzania to write for a Tanzanian soap opera. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my short story, Too Cool, and I would like to offer a uh, trigger warning for violence. Um, it's not dying, Eve said, creating a pointed contrast with the purr of the wind and the scraping that we had not yet experienced since the tumultuous stop of motion. Everything felt aggressive after that screeching halt. The light breeze, the too bright sun. What do we do, Rachel said in a watery voice. She couldn't seem to find a comfortable way to stand. Her legs were too long. Maybe there's someone we can call. I suggested. Do you think we could take it with us? Eve squinted into the whitening fog. Would it fit in the car? Rachel asked. We all looked at the deer. Its eyelid was covered in a soft fur that vibrated. It sounded a quiet trombone in the back of its throat. Should we move it? I asked with a slight nod towards it. We looked at the deer. We can't just leave it here. Rachel's voice broke. Fuck. It's in pain, I glared at her. It'll die, Eve nodded. We nodded. We watched the deer. Minutes passed. The hoof scraped the asphalt. I turned and stared at Eve. She turned her head, attuned to the movement. Our eyes met. And then she turned toward the car and unlocked the trunk. We watched her dig under Harriet the lawn chair for a green and black duffel bag. She pulled out two metal baseball bats, silver with peeling layers of tape on the grips. Eve handed me one. We looked at the deer. It won't fit, Rachel whispered. It can't fit, I said, drifting sandal tan feet toward the deer. It's in pain, Eve followed me. It's in pain, Rachel agreed. I circled to the other side of the deer, inches away from the path of its hoof. Eve lifted her bat to the point at its head. The bat hovered there, skimming its eyelashes. Rachel walked to the side, five feet from the deer's head. With weak ease, Eve lifted the bat high in the air, a focal point for the trees to bend toward. Then she brought the bat down in a shaking blow to the deer's jawbone. An identifiably flesh-padded crunch ate at our ears. The deer moaned in a pitch I'd never heard. Eve lifted the bat again, bringing it down harder this time, splintering the snout. A gurgle of snot and blood now accompanied the forest-like rumble of the deer's muted wails. Shit, Mary, you try. Eve clutched her bat and wiped her forehead. I put one foot forward, positioning myself to use my body's weight in the blow. I brought the bat down with the same fleshy splintering slightly above Eve's first mark. We could feel teeth clatter loose. The deer wheezed and a few splats of blood flung out in oozes. I lifted the bat again. I brought it down with more force, silver gleaming and blurring. The back of the skull caved in. A gurgle, followed by another small burst of blood, leaked out of the deer's smashed snout. Eve lifted her bat again. The deer's ear smashed inward and stuck against its head. Rachel walked to the trunk and sifted through the clutter until I heard the clink of glass. She returned to the deer with the neck of a beer bottle, ending in a lopsidedly jagged point. She squatted down, breaths away from the deer's face. The blue stripe of color from her spilt nail polish cracked with the new tension on her skin. Rachel plunged the sharp end of the bottle into the deer's eye. A milky liquid leaked from the point. The deer's hoof twitched in a slightly irregular sharpness, and a gurgle splattered with more blood by the snout. I dropped my bat to the road in a three-crash three landing and walked to the trunk. There were two bottles that were still intact in the closest case of beer, and I grabbed one. I returned to our friend, crouched, and crashed the bottle against its skull. Beer spilt over the deer's face and mixed with the blood spots. The deer was making bubbles in the golden liquid. God fucking damn it, Eve shrieked as she brought her bat down again, splintering the glass into freckles on the deer. Shit, Eve, you almost hit us. Rachel and I had swung backwards, my feet just dipping in the beer. We watched the deer bubble, 
a pathetic balloon. We watched it, but then Rachel said, maybe we should run over it again. Thank you. Our next reader is Claire Marie Stancheck. Stancheck? Stancheck. Uh, Claire Marie is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley where she also teaches. Recent poems have appeared in or are forthcoming from Berkeley Poetry Review, Bone Bouquet, Colorado Review, Cordite, Oversound, Real Poetic, and Typo, among others. Her first full-length collection of poems, Mouths, is forthcoming from Nomi Press in 2017. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be reading in this series with, with you all. Um, so I'm going to read an excerpt from a longer piece. Um, when I wrote this, I was thinking um, a lot about police violence, and especially the problematic way police violence is described in mainstream news sources. So when a cop murders someone, it's called an officer-involved shooting. Um, this weirdly passive construction. Um, so I tried to write a spell um, or an incantation that would um, interrupt or rechannel some of that institutional violence. And it's called Riot of. Petals stuck, struck, and splayed on murky glass. Sun, a dust in the lungs. Where spell shudders your fingers. Here it goes, watch closely. A regular turn. Path of wood rings, ring worms, ringing steel bells. Officer involved shooting means mouths were unhinged hinges creaking at night. Here it goes, watch closely. Take down the town, take the looping wires down, take the rooftops and their shining shingles, take the windows, windows shining in the town, take the posters, the banana stands, the china cups, chipped computer chips, take them, computers with them, take them down to the ground. Blair snare. Chairs suddenly fall over all the chairs there were falling fell. Three women hunched close, gesticulating, a nodding branch nose, what thought? the crow. Time is what life leaks, leaves behind. Pipes and vents maze the walls, follow them. A rooted gate goes flying, smacks a lamppost which also flies, both go lurching out of sight. Down on the night the lurching lamppost casts a careening sheen. A dizzy sheen frazzles and flummoxes ones who walk below, their merriment does it falter. Shots were fired. Officer-involved shooting means juniper berries out of my chewed mouth. What is the ground but what the ground fells, ground falls, grounds down groaning? What was the ground but what I threw down, gently swaying light fixtures, plastic geraniums, accordion keys, punches glass, I, the beat, beat, beat. What was ground down took the ground up, streaming, screaming dirt from pockets and pores whose blood was window bright. And ground what was, what was, what bore down, what bears, bear the grounds now, how ground. Windows bright whose shards shone, new light, light without sense, sense blaring, sense blooming, riot. The moon is a yellowing bruise, but officer-involved shooting enchanted the bystanders. Windows whose berries brightened the day, berries whose blush brightened up the penises. Who are you wearing? No, really. Paint falls off in flakes, circular scuffs on the ground, tire streaks whose cheeks peaked. Three umbrellas, two open, shut the fuck up. Rain in the puddles and puddles in the mouths. More people are alive now than have ever died, or more rats were born today than bats died yesterday. The dead speak by rubbing their noses against glass, leaving grease on the pane, slamming doors, fussing with their ribbons, their trappings, shadows, fidgeting generally. The dead speak by signs, and they go like this, watch closely. A creak, a beak sometimes in the mirror, a thing will move, sinister. 
room of tables at crooked angles all fall down. You will never really know what it feels like, but when the inanimate call, chorus of dust, I mean, the dust in your nose is a song, bless you. Officer involved shooting means the mouth is speaking for itself, clattering against my wooden teeth. Officer involved shooting means I want to hear you say it. Go ahead. Rock, throw it, window, already smashed. When the rock face runs live with avalanching dirt rootless, the sound is applause, dry grasp of the damned, dust. Dust in the lungs, are the petals slipping? Are they rotting, stinking in the moist fumes of morning sun? A hungry person holds a bun wrapped in plastic. The plastic gleams, gives off an itching, sticky, and pulling stink. A hungry dog sits down. The sign for spell arrives at your doorstep, the stamp a hand in a jug of blood. Would you take a picture of us standing under this shadow? Would you hold this while I take a shit? I was doing fine until I remembered about the stampede. Up came the rose beds, up bled the crow's heads. You were known to talk in your sleep, but in death you just stared. Sometimes in the mirror, sinister. Rune was ruin in the avalanche sun. It doesn't really happen any other time. Just a minute. Shake down the wall. In rubble, under rubble, you will find a bird, a poster, a banana stand, china cups chipped, bat the bird away, egg in rubble, leave the egg. Beside the egg, look closely, catch the glimmer of a key, wedge the key into your fist, open hole, open ground, open hole in the ground, fall into the hole. In the hole, you will feel cold, seize the cold, take in the cold. In the cold, finds dark, in dark, the wall, Rip up the wall, rip it by the roots with your teeth, roots of your teeth, rip it. Your teeth will wrench out torn, flick them bleeding marbles at the wall. Then the wall will fall in rubble, under rubble, will open a flight of stairs, descend them. Under the stairs, the bird's weight beaked. Fend it off with the cold coiled under your tongue. Rubble sprouts by night. Down rubble roots go shooting. Avoid the shoots, for they will branch and dance you, vein you new, pin and pain you, slew through. Trash burns, smell it. Egg has hatched, hatched a computer, hatched another key, hatched a tooth clawing. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Jesslyn Wittell. Jesslyn is a third year studying English and computer science. Her background is primarily in poetry, and as a result, she gravitates towards fiction that puts characters under the microscope, zooming in on their thoughts and the quiet force of everyday decisions. That made this sound a lot more exciting than it's going to be. Um, I'm going to read the opening of a short story that I wrote this semester for a class um, that's part of a longer collection I'm looking at of kind of young children and what happens to them as they evolve over their lives in this kind of shift from innocence to experience. So this is Things We Did. We started small, five girls at a corner table in the food court, the September heat wave gluing our thighs to the red plastic seats. The mall was busy for a Sunday full of old women wearing visors inside, babysitters chatting while little kids tussled in the play center, gray-clad teen boys drifting like smog through the tables, and I wanted to play anything else instead of spilling our secrets with fries and bottle caps in public space. Never have I ever shoplifted. Never have I ever met someone famous. Never have I ever been out of the country. Never have I ever been in love. That was mine, and no one clapped. Boring, sang Lena. She was conducting the game like one of her improv rituals. And when she talked, I could see gum in her mouth, which she was chewing while drinking a smoothie. I hoped it was fruit-flavored gum. She shook her finger and gave a decent impression of Sister Catherine. Eleanor, my child, you need to give us a better confession. Go again. Someone else go. V took over. Never have I ever cheated on a test. Lena and Kiki clapped, and I wanted to look away. 
I felt like a voyeur watching something bizarrely intimate. I'd never cheated, but if I had, I wouldn't admit it with such... What did I see in Lena's eyes? Such smugness. At least V hadn't cheated. She was my best friend at Sacred Heart, and that, wouldn't, that would have felt much like a betrayal. And Kiki? I should have expected as much. She didn't go to Sacred Heart, but V and Lena knew her from theater, which they did outside of school because Sacred Heart's code of conduct didn't allow nail polish, much less musicals written after 1940. I remembered Kiki from elementary school, but she'd grown out of the scholarship kid who'd lived in a car for most of fifth grade. Her once frizzy hair was dyed licorice red and fell like a velvet curtain to the small of her back. Where it swooped over her left ear, I could see four studs and an industrial piercing, all of the same steely black metal. She had great makeup too, gold eyeshadow and sharp mascara that turned the harsh mall lights into magazine gloss. She sprawled listless and elegant in the booth, her gaze sliding over Lena's shoulder to search for better adventures. She had a worldliness about her that I'd only seen in much older women. Not an espresso in Paris kind of worldliness, something grittier, more real, beautiful and horrible like roadside flares flagging a car crash and you couldn't look away. Gravitas, said the SAT flashcard that had replaced my brain. I wondered if she was uncomfortable especially when the other girls mentioned the places they'd traveled that summer or the cars they wanted for the impending wave of 16 birth, sweet 16 birthdays. But no one questioned her presence in the group. We were all too interested in her. Eleanor, go, V said, ripping me back into the game. I didn't have enough time or I would have said something so humiliating. Never have I ever been drunk. Everyone clapped. They looked disappointed in me. Why not? Asked um, Lena. I don't know, maybe because it's brain poison? Oh, sweetie, V said. We'll fix that, yeah? Lena said, you've got to come over. Don't be afraid of it, Kiki said. I looked at the ground, and Kiki looked at V with a smirk. After that, the game morphed into careful assists targeted at specific confessions. Never have I ever borrowed my dad's Lexus, Lena clapped. You don't even have a license, I pointed out. Exactly, said V. Lena wiggled in her seat, ready to return the favor. Never have I ever smoked weed with my cousins. Then V clapped, and I tried to smile like I was impressed and entertained. I don't think I convinced anyone, because none of them set me up for anything. Not that I'd done anything worse, worth mentioning, but I still kind of wanted to feel included. I felt sorry for myself. It was a nice kind of pain, like rolling out a cramp in your shin after summer camp. When V and Kiki calmed down, and my turn rolled around again, I wanted to confess myself to these girls. My loneliness, the starched crispness of my soul. They needed to understand that I was trying. Don't give up on me. Should I, though? I wasn't ashamed. No, I was ashamed, but it was true, and I was only 14. I had time. Maybe I wasn't alone, either. I took a deep breath. Never have I ever kissed a boy. They all clapped. Thank you. So our next reader is Anthony Williams. Anthony Williams is a graduating senior and Mellon Mays undergraduate fellow studying sociology, theater, and performance studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Anthony is also a writer, an actor, director, and editor-in-chief of the African Black Coalition. Hi, everyone. My name is Anthony. Um, I'm going to be reading a piece for you that uh, I'm usually an essayist and a poet and a writer. Um, this is the first play that I wrote, but it's an adap adaptation of an Alice Walker piece. Um, so to give you context, I will be reading the characters' names. Um, this happens, it's chapter uh, four, and it happens about halfway through the play, chapter four, scene four. Um, and it's titled Eight Tomboy. And the title of the play is Beauty, When the Other Dancer is the Self. And that's after the same name of the essay. Four, eight, tomboy. The stage is bare minus Alice, who may roam the downstage area. Light shift. During the transition, little Alice drags the makeshift garage down center, slightly stage left. On the top of the structure is a wooden sign in all lowercase that reads, garage. The structure should be pieces of tin nailed across some poles. A piece of wire hangs off the side of the roof. Little Alice climbs on top of it with her bow and arrow, looking out toward the audience, the fields. The brothers assume their positions from earlier, shooting at the psych. It is sunset. Alice. One day while I'm standing on top of our makeshift garage, holding my bow and arrow and looking out toward the fields, a large flash and bang, sound and light signal that little Alice has been hit in her right eye. She clutches her right eye and looks down as she speaks the next line. The psych and lights on stage turn from regular to pink to red throughout the scene. The brothers turn around slowly, placing their guns down before running to her. After Alice's ow, she runs over to little Alice to hold her. 
Little Alice does not outwardly acknowledge her older self. Little Alice. Ow! Alice. Ow. The brothers. Sorry! Alice. I feel an incredible blow in my right eye. I look down just in time to see my brother lower his gun. Both brothers rush to my side. My eye stings and I cover it with my hand. In a childhood panic, the brothers blurt out their next few lines, thinking on their feet. Brother Jimmy, if you tell, brother, we will get a whipping, brother Jimmy. You don't want that to happen, do you? Little Alice shakes her head no, almost on the verge of tears, but trying to keep it together. Brother Jimmy looks around for a moment. What is he looking for? Brother Jimmy, here's a piece of wire, beat, to say you stepped on one end of it and the other flew up and hit you. Alice, the pain is beginning to start. Yes, I say, little Alice, yes. Alice, yes, I will say that little Alice is what happened. Beat, Alice, if I do not say this is what happened, I know my brothers will find ways to make me wish I had. But now I will say anything that gets me to my mother. Alice starts upstage right to watch the scene unfold. Brother Jimmy gives little Alice a hug while her arms stay at her side. She doesn't want to be hugged. Brother stands off to the side, more aware of this fact than his older brother. The brothers run over to stand in front of Alice. The walkers enter stage left and run toward their daughter, looking over at little Alice's would-be babysitters, the brothers. The action of the next few lines unfolds down left, sans porch, only the bench. The tree mentioned is off in the distance in the audience. Little Alice is almost in a daze. Alice, confronted by our parents, the brothers and little Alice, we stick to the lie agreed upon. Alice, they place me on a bench on the porch and I close my left eye while they examine the right. There's a tree growing from underneath the porch that climbs past the railing to the roof. It is the last thing my right eye sees. I watch as its trunk, its branches, and then its leaves are blotted out by the rising blood. I am in shock. By this point, little Alice has been laid on the bench with her parents upstage of the bench on either side. The action is suggestive, meaning that the walkers may be simply dabbing her sweat and holding her hand. Alice, first there is intense fever, which my father tries to break using lily leaves bound around my head. Then there are chills. My mother tries to get me to eat soup. Eventually, I do not know how, my parents learn what has happened. Little Alice is placed back in an upright position as her parents stand behind her. A white doctor enters stage right and crosses down left to examine little Alice. Alice, a week after, little Alice, the accident, Alice, they take me to see a doctor. Doctor, looking into, her, looking into her eye and shaking his head. Why did you wait so long to come? Eyes are sympathetic. If one is blind, the other will likely become blind too. Alice, this comment of the doctors terrifies me, but it is really how I look that bothers me most. Where the BB pellet struck, there is a little Alice, glob. Alice, of whitish scar tissue, a hideous cataract on my eye. Now when I stare at people, a favorite pastime up to now, they will stare back. Little Alice, not at the cute girl, but at my scar. Alice, for six years I do not stare at anyone because I do not raise my head. Little Alice exits stage left. When she returns, she is in the garb of a regular eight-year-old. Her hair and clothes should be nondescript, but should not look like the tomboy before. Now she does not want to be seen. Alice. Years later, in the throes of a midlife crisis, I asked my mother and sister whether I changed after the accident. Mrs. Walker and Sister Ruth, off stage from both sides, nonchalantly, no. Alice, they say puzzled. Mrs. Walker and Sister Ruth, what do you mean? Alice, trying not to show her aggravation, what do I mean? Thank you. <laughs>